All right, so this video is going to be about smaller chain fatty acids that we call MCTs or medium chain triglycerides, and then moving even smaller and looking at sort of the smallest fatty acid that we can think about for carbons is butyrate and then ketone bodies. So just a little review of where we've been, and if you haven't watched these videos already, they might be helpful to put a lot of this in context. We're talking about fatty acids, okay? Fatty acids being my fingers here that we have here, a uh, single fatty acid chain. Uh, we talked about the different kinds of fatty acids. We talked about how structure sort of affords function in terms of whether they're fats or oils, having to do with intermolecular forces. Um, and then uh, again, a deep dive on what we see in our food products, whether they're saturated fats, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fats, uh, and oils, and then importantly, highlighting the, uh, the issues with trans fats. Uh, another video talked about uh, the omega fats that we have, and so now we're sort of here to talk about um, the smaller chain fatty acids, uh, things that we find in coconut oils, for example, and then some of these even smaller pieces. So quickly here talking about uh, MCTs, these stand for medium chain triglycerides, so that's an acronym here. We've got medium chain triglycerides. And really, we're talking about these small chain fatty acids that are hooked onto a glycerol backbone to make these triglycerides with these smaller fatty acids. So again, what we're really talking about is these guys here. Here we're gonna have C6, C8, C10, and C12. And when we talk about coconut oils uh, and things that you find in coconut oils, those tend to be sort of of the C12 variety. Um, things that are smaller than this, one of the things that makes them kind of problematic is they tend to be not very palatable. They tend to be um, sort of very uh, uh, bitter or they don't taste very good. Um, and so sort of having these in terms of a dietary consumption, not necessarily, very, not necessarily very palatable. But highlighting that coconut oils are really good oils to cook with. Some people might not like them because if you don't like coconut flavor, that tends to sort of come along with it. Um, but why people are interested in these medium chain or smaller chain fatty acid triglycerides are they are a great way to provide quick energy. And why that is, is these um, medium chain triglycerides are readily converted into ketone bodies. We'll learn more next semester when we talk about fatty acid metabolism, sort of how this process happens, how we generate ketone bodies, okay? But ketone bodies are really important. We'll get to this in a little bit of a deep dive in a minute, but ketone bodies, two things that are uh, really important about ketone bodies is that they are fat derived Okay, but hydrophilic. And this is really important because if we think about the four classes of biological molecules that we've talked about, first talked about um, nucleic acids built from nucleotides, right? I'm not gonna include those in this group because the other three really can be used as macronutrients, right? We have proteins that are comprised of amino acids. Again, that can be a, uh, a, a food or a fuel that we would consider consuming. Then we have carbohydrates, right? Polymers of monosaccharides polymerized to form polysaccharides. And right now we're talking about lipids and triglycerides. And they're not really a polymer, but we're gonna talk about the linkages that we have that hook these fatty acids onto a glycerol backbone. But if we think about these three main macronutrients, and just from a dietary standpoint, you've probably talked about proteins, carbs, and fats, right? Those are our, four, our three main sort of fuel products, right? With carbohydrates and with proteins, we have hydrophilic fuels, right? Though generally water soluble, we don't need to think about transport issues. What we have with triglycerides is we have transport issues because it's hydrophobic. We're gonna get to that when we talk about cholesterol and how we um, transport lipids throughout our body. But we've got this hydrophobic thing here. The other thing that's a little bit different is when we talk about where we have reserves of these macronutrients in our body. Okay, first talking about carbohydrates, right? The importance of maintaining blood sugar levels. But here's the thing with carbohydrates. We do have a storage reserve of carbohydrates as a polymer, glycosidically linked glucose as glycogen in our liver. But we talked about that really only is about a 12 hour supply, not very long. 
okay? So we need to make sure we have that hydrophilic fuel circulating. Well, that's okay because we know that we can make glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. We call that gluconeogenesis. So we're always going to be able to either break down our glycogen and remedy low blood sugar, or we're going to be able to synthesize glucose from non-carbohydrate precursors. Okay, but that's an important hydrophilic circulating fuel. I'm going to talk about proteins here just very briefly, but I want to highlight that we don't generally think about consuming proteins as fuel. Protein consumption is really to take in the essential amino acids that we need. The intent of consuming proteins is not for fuel. We can break them down for fuel, but really it's for using them as building blocks. So to that end, I'm really not going to consider sort of these as a reserve. We don't have an intended reserve of protein in our body because they don't really consume it as a fuel. Two main fuels we have are carbohydrates excess stored as glycogen, maximum of 12 hour supply, and that's again a hydrophilic circulating fuel. Carbohydrates, um, we don't again have a lot, but lipids, we generally have a much more open-ended reserve. We can have between two to three months of energy stored in our adipose tissue. But again, that is um, uh, a reserve we're gonna talk about, a bank deposit, if you will, that we can't necessarily tap into overly readily. And part of the problem too is that this is a hydrophobic molecule. We have transport issues. So ketone bodies kind of live in this middle space where they're fat derived, but they circulate like a hydrophilic fuel. And I know that was a lot of sort of background and context for that, but I want to make sure to highlight ketone bodies are a really important piece to metabolic health. Okay, so we're going to get to ketone bodies in just a second here, but I want to just take and talk briefly about this smallest of uh, fatty acids that we have with uh, small chain fatty acids as butyrate. So this is again a C4. I'm going to zoom in here so we can highlight. This is a four carbon fatty acid. So this is C4. Now this is butyrate. And why this is important is this is an important fuel for colonocytes. Okay, those are the cells that make up your colon. We talked a little bit about this in class today, so I'll make sure just to summarize and sort of highlight it here. When you think about your GI tract, starts up here, ends you know, down at your anus, right? That represents a giant tube. And the inside of your guts, even though it's inside of you, is really the outside environment, right? Your mouth is the beginning of the outside environment and your anus is sort of the end part of that outside environment. It is a tube that goes through the entirety of your body. What connects or what separates you from that outside environment in the, you know, in, in your abdominal sort of cavity is one single cell thick in your small intestine and in your large intestine. So if we very simply sort of break your digestive system up into three parts, we've got your stomach, we've got your small intestine, we've got your large intestine. The small intestine, or I'm sorry, the, your, your stomach is really meant for starting that preliminary breakdown. It's got a very low pH, right, that helps to sort of uh, digest and begin to break down these fuel molecules. But it's also important because it uh, pretty much is going to eliminate a lot of viruses and bacteria that could be problematic right? We talked about bacteria that live in your large intestine. By and large, you should not have bacteria living in your small intestine or your stomach, but we also talked about H. pylori, right? That is a bacteria that is known to live in and colonize um, the stomach, and it is known to cause um, ulcers, right? But we've got your stomach, Importantly, the purpose of your small intestine, a single cell thick, is to bring in monomers. This is a really important thing when we talk about these three polymers, whether it's proteins, carbohydrates, or lipids. Again, lipids not really being polymers, but we have a linkage that connects things together. We need to, with proteins, break that peptide linkage to generate free amino acids. That's what's supposed to come out of your GI tract. When we talk about carbohydrates, monosaccharides are the only thing that we can get out of your GI tract in your small intestine. So we need to break that linkage. We talked about that's why, you know, people who are lactose intolerant, you can't break that glycosidic linkage that we have in lactose between galactose and glucose. And so it finds its way down to your large intestine and the bacteria that live there have a go at it. 
okay? And then thirdly, when we're talking about these triglycerides, what we have here is we've got a linkage that hooks our fatty acids onto our glycerol backbone. It's an ester linkage, and you cannot get triglycerides out of your digestive tract. You have to at least snip off one fatty acid, and then you can get free fatty acids or those diacylglycerides out of your um, digestive tract. But we have to break things down. So your colonocytes, like butyrate, what's the nice thing with butyrate is sometimes that's a breakdown product of things that the probiotics in your gut can produce. So highlighting that your probiotics, these are your microbiome. These are the bacteria that live in your large intestine. We highlighted that it's important that these bacteria stay in your large intestine. When they make their way up and colonize your small intestine, that's called uh, SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or outgrowth. We're not supposed to have bacteria living in our small intestine. Okay, bacteria are supposed to live in your large intestine. So having a healthy microbiome is absolutely key to sort of having overall sort of health. And a part of that is using proper prebiotics. So what are prebiotics? Prebiotics are the food that your probiotics, the microbiome, the, your bacteria in your gut need to eat. So it makes no sense to have a whole bunch of healthy probiotics that you take if you are not simultaneously feeding them the right prebiotic, which generally are things like fiber, uh, raw banana, not raw, like less uh, ripened bananas, which have more resistant starch. These are all things that they can make their way down to your large intestine without you fully consuming them. And so then your bacteria can have a go at it and you can provide some nutrition for your bacteria there. Okay, so small chain fatty acids, again, butyrate is a really important healthy component of your large intestinal sort of um, environment. It feeds your colonocytes. I'm gonna come over here. Well, first let's highlight here. I'm gonna look here in red here. I wanna highlight the difference between what we have at that carbon atom versus this carbon atom versus this carbon atom. These are all four carbon molecules, okay? So let's highlight that acetoacetate is C4 and so is beta-hydroxybutyrate. One of the important skills that you need to be able to do in this course is to recognize the kinds of chemistry that might interconvert things. If things are sort of the same number of carbon atoms here, they all have this carboxylic acid functional group here, the main difference between these molecules is the oxidation state of that carbon atom, okay? In butyrate, it's fully reduced, and then we have beta-hydroxybutyrate, where it's a little bit more oxidized, and then the fully oxidized form is going to be acetoacetate. So that's important here because when we look at these ketone bodies, we can recognize that the relationship that we have between acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate is that they are interchangeable by redox chemistry, right? Acetoacetate is the oxidized form of beta-hydroxybutyrate. So again, this is the oxidized form, whereas beta-hydroxybutyrate is the reduced form. Okay, so these are two important ketone bodies that we're going to have. And again, they can be circulating in your blood in either the oxidized or the reduced form. But another thing that is listed here as these ketone bodies is acetone. And I want you to recognize if we again look at these molecules and say, how are they different? We can see that acetone is a C3 molecule. So it has lost a carbon atom. And in general, when we think about how things lose carbon atoms, we often can lose things as carbon dioxide, right? It was pointed out today that we can look and we can see that what's different between these molecules that is missing that carboxylate group. What we have here with uh, acetoacetate is it is a beta keto acid. This is gonna be a theme we're gonna see a lot when we talk about fuel metabolism. When you have beta keto acids, they easily decarboxylate, lose CO2, and that is how we are going to be generating that CO2 waste product for much of the fuel metabolism equation we have. Remember, fuel plus oxygen gives carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Much of the carbon dioxide that is liberated is liberated when we have beta keto acids that easily lose CO2. We'll talk about you can have alpha keto acids that also eliminate CO2, but that doesn't happen spontaneously. 
needs a little help for that. Okay, so why am I spending so much time talking about ketone bodies? Why are they so important? Two stories to highlight here, okay? You've probably heard of ketone bodies when we talk about something like the ketogenic diet, okay? So let's talk about why and when you might be producing ketone bodies. Well, I highlighted that they're fat-derived and they are a hydrophilic fuel. So times where your body might be naturally producing ketone bodies are when you are in a fasted state, right? You are low in sort of your fuel. You might be low in your blood sugar, but not low where you're needing to make glucose, but you might be low in your overall fuel. Again, this is very common when we talk about either a ketogenic diet or a fasted state. What you're going to be doing is tapping into those adipose reserves that you have and converting those into a hydrophilic fuel. And this is really important because your brain really needs and prefers hydrophilic fuels. So getting glucose into your brain or getting ketone bodies, being hydrophilic into your brain happens very easily. So ketogenic diets, fasted states are going to have elevated levels of ketone bodies because we're using our ample reserves of adipose tissue and triglycerides and converting them into ketone bodies, which we can easily circulate throughout the body without having transport issues. Here's the other time that you're going to see ketone bodies. And you may have heard about this if you've heard about somebody who is a diabetic and they're in a state of diabetic ketoacidosis. Now what happens with whether it's a type 1 or a type 2 diabetic, remember type 1 diabetics cannot produce insulin, type 2 diabetics produce it but don't listen to it. In either case, what ends up happening is you have very high toxic levels of blood sugar. Okay, what happens when you have high levels of a toxic species in your blood? You have to find a way to get rid of it, right? So often you might urinate it out. Um, and so we can see for a diabetic that is in a state of ketoacidosis, they've got high blood ketone levels. They also may be spilling out into their urine. So you may see uh, high urine levels of ketone bodies, okay? Mm -hmm. But you might ask the question, why would a diabetic have high levels of ketone bodies? So remember what's happening with somebody who has super high levels of blood sugar. Now the problem is that they're not producing insulin or not listening to insulin to get that blood sugar into their cells. So right now their cells think that they are starving. So what they're doing is they're secreting a lot of signals that say, hey, need state, need state, need state. So what's happening is your body is trying to tap into your adipose tissue reserves, right? And then they are producing a ton of hydrophilic circulating fuel so that you can try to help with this, you know, uh, this need state that you're experiencing, okay? But the problem is, is that that signal might never get shut off. So you're going to have excess levels of these ketone bodies that are put out into the blood. You'll notice that these are carboxylic acids. They're going to be dropping blood pH, putting us into a state of equivalently metabolic acidosis. We call this ketoacidosis, and this can become life-threatening. So again, you're going to have super high levels of ketone bodies in a diabetic patient who is in a sugar sort of crisis. Very, very high sugar levels are going to also uh, often come with high levels of ketone bodies. What also happens here is your body's going to try to rid itself of those excessively high levels of ketone bodies by doing this decarboxylation chemistry, converting acetoacetate into acetone, which is much more volatile, you can breathe it out. So one of the hallmarks of a diabetic patient who is in a state of diabetic ketoacidosis is you can actually smell acetone on their breath. It's kind of a sweet smell, but this is a good indication that this person, you know, who maybe has passed out, who maybe is slurring their words or, or, or not sort of behaving properly might even seem like they're intoxicated. They're not intoxicated. They have excessively high blood sugar levels and that's putting their body into a state of shock. And again, telling um, uh, for that is they're going to have that sweet smell on their breath because they're uh, exhaling acetone as a way to try to offload excessive levels of these ketone bodies. Okay, so that's all I think I wanted to say about these smaller chain fatty acids as well as um, the ability of fatty acids to be uh, produced or uh, converted into ketone bodies. Again, an important fat-derived and hydrophilic circulating fuel.